before we uh, consider the message, there's a few things that I want to share with you. First of all, um, we don't, our, our communion or our Lord's Suppers is not a closed service. There are churches who say that if you're not a member of their church, then you cannot participate or partake of the Lord's Supper on that day. But we're not like that. We believe that Scripture teaches that if you are born again, if you're saved, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, you have every right to celebrate with us this morning the Lord's Supper, whether you're a member or not of this church. There are only two reasons why you should not celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning. Number one, and that is if you are not a believer. If you are not saved, if you are not a Christian, then you should not partake of this supper. It is for believers. It is because we recognize that Jesus Christ has paid our sin debt, and our faith and trust is what he did, and what he did alone. And so it is only for born-again believers. There's another reason why a person might not take the Lord's Supper. That is if you have unconfessed sin in your life. We'll see that as Paul talked about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that if you have unconfessed sin in your life, to partake or to participate in the Lord's Supper could bring God's chastisement, could bring his discipline in your life. And so it's better that, that you and I as individuals examine our own hearts, and if there is anything there, wrong, sin that is in con unconfessed, then we, we need to get that right, right now. So that's why we generally share a message before we observe the Lord's Supper, is to give Holy Spirit an opportunity to work in your heart and life and bring you to repentance so that when we do participate and partake of the Lord's Supper, you're not bringing God's judgment, his chastisement in your life. We'll see that clearly here in a moment. I believe Brother Jameson preached out of Acts chapter 2 last week. I, I was in with the children, so I'm not sure what he talked about, but I, I'm just going to make a brief uh, reference to a part of what I think he may have talked about. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 40, verse 42. You see, since the beginning of the church, it, is, it was always customary for believers to gather together and to share a meal. It says in verse 42 of Acts 2, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And then in verse 46, And day by day they attended the temple together, Breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. One of the reasons that the children are staying in here this morning is because the Lord's Supper was always done together. And I want us to be together this morning, not scattered all over the, the place. I want us to be together. You say, well... What do, what do I do with my children who, who have never made a profession of faith? He, li, listen, parents, what a beautiful opportunity to teach your children the things of God. They're going to see what we do, and you, it, it's up to you to counsel your children. And you know if your children have made professions of faith or not. And so if they've never made a profession of faith, you know, as far as you know, they have never trusted Jesus Christ and made that profession public, then advise your children that they're to let this go by. And then when you get home, 
get the Bible and, and just use this as a teaching opportunity to teach your children. And if you need help with that, Brother Jameson, myself, others are more than willing. We'll, we'll come and help do that. So I'm glad the children are, are with us this morning because they need to witness this. You see, the Lord's Supper is an opportunity for fellowship and for the sharing with others who are less privileged. That is this fellowship meal. They, they would meet together and almost every time they met, usually every time they met, they would share a huge meal. It, it would be like our potluck. Now, I, I, I've never been much on potluck. I don't like eating out of a pot. I don't believe in luck. But that's what we call it, so I, I'm okay with that. I, I like it, a fellowship meal. So they would share a fellowship meal together, but it was a time, it was an opportunity when, when those who had much could bring much and share with those who had very little. They called this meal, they called it the love feast. And the reason was because it displayed the love between the believers, the care and the concern that they had for one another. And so this meal was always climaxed by an observance of the Lord's Supper. And Paul now wrote, uh, Paul didn't write Acts. We see where Paul was very busy throughout the book of Acts, but he did write 1 Corinthians. He wrote 1 Corinthians in about A.D. 56. Now, just kind of do a, a rough math with me here just a little bit. Uh, Jesus probably entered into the ministry somewhere around age 30, right? We believe that Jesus was born according to, we don't know the exact date, but we believe it was sometime between four and six, uh, what do you believe? Oh, okay, I say four and six BC, but it really doesn't matter. A, a good uh, ballpark number Jesus was probably about 33 when he died, somewhere in that area, 33 years old when he died. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians in A.D. 56. So now we're talking about less than 25 years. Notice what happened. By now, there are serious problems in the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul's uh, letter to the Corinthian church. Now, this is after the gospel had gone out through uh, parts of the known world. Paul came in and he established this church in Corinth. And in less than 25 years, there were already serious problems in the church. In Acts chapter 2, it is a glorious time. These people were together. There was total unity. They loved one another they cared for one another. They shared with one another so that no one, even Acts 2 says, that none of them had need. By the time we get to 1 Corinthians and this church of Corinth, there are some serious problems in the church. In Acts chapter 3, notice what it says in verse 1. But I, brethren, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ... I have fed you with milk and not solid food, for you are not able to bear it. Even now you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely humans? Or the King James says, carnal. In other words, very, very unspiritual. Here they were, they, they, they had created cliques in their church. Now, I, I, I get it when people say, well, there's cliques down in that church. I've been accused of being in a clique in this church. I'm not in a clique in anybody's church. But there are, there, there are things that people have in common with one another, and because they share things in common with one another, they spend probably more time with each other than they do others. 
But that's not a click. Here's what a click in the church is. See, we sometimes we confuse that because we say, well, well, you know, they got their little group over there and, and that's just a click. And uh, it may just be that this click that you claim, this group that you claim to be a click, maybe they just enjoy going out to eat dinner. They, they just do that. And, and a lot of people don't want to go out and eat dinner. I, I don't care about going out to dinner. I don't care about all that. I sure don't, I don't even want to go to Shreveport, okay? I, especially at night. You know, I like Grand Cane, and, and I feel safe, and I feel at home right here in Grand Cane. I like Grand Cane. I love it here. And so, so maybe I, I like to play golf. Now, I don't play golf with anybody in the church. Occasionally, I will we'll game up. But I guarantee you, if we had some serious golfers in this church, we, we'd be, boy, we'd be together because I love to play golf. But listen, that's not what a click is. A clique is a group of people who think they're a little bit better than anybody else. They think they're a little bit wiser than anybody else. They think they're a little more prosperous than anybody else, and they look down on the down and outers. Listen, in less than 25 years, this is where this church had come. Kind of sounds like some of us who get saved, and we're, we're, boy, we're growing in the Lord, and we're excited about it. And for the first 10 years, man, we are right there. We are Johnny on the spot. We are faithful. We love the Lord. We love to sing. We love to praise. We love to get involved in the work. We, we, we like cutting the grass. But all of a sudden, we just kind of let the world creep in on us, and we become worldly, and we think like the world, and we act like the world. This is where the Corinthian church was. And in their acting like the world, they thought they were so spiritual. And yet Paul says, you're babes in Christ. You fed on the milk of the word, which is for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but everlasting life. Oh, you got that part. You got that. You got the part that says, ask uh, the Lord uh, anything believing and he'll give it to all oh, you got that part we you know we got it but all of a sudden when it comes to talking about humility and patience and perseverance and 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 trials and struggle, well we 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 don't want any of that we treat it like a smorgasbord at ryan's cafe or ryan's restaurant i'll take a little bit of this i'll take blessings yeah heap them on me fill my plate lord I'll take blessings, I'll take, I'll take gentleness, I'll take kindness as long as it's to me, as long, long as I don't give it, as long as I get it. And we treat the church sometimes, and we treat the Lord like some kind of smorgasbord religion where we just get what we want and leave the rest. Hello? Amen, Brother Mike. <laughs> so, as a result of that, these love feasts were doing more harm in the church than they were good. They, they, were, they started out in Acts chapter 2, right after Jesus uh, rose from the grave and ascended to heaven. To, man, I'm, I'm going to tell you, this love feast, this was the thing. People flocked to that because there was exception. There was, there was fellowship. There was love and concern and care for one another. And less than 25 years later, now there, there, there are problems and division, strife in the church. They were doing more harm than good. And instead of fellowshipping with one another, they were arguing against one another and plotting. Now, turn to, having set the stage, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There were divisions even at the Lord's table. Let me just say that it is 
probably one of the most serious moments in a time of worship is when we observe the Lord's Supper. Why? Because Jesus said, when we do this, we do this in remembrance of him. And it is a very serious thing to come to this moment with an unprepared heart, either not saved or unrepentant sin in your life. The Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper is so serious that people who came and observed the Lord's Supper in an unworthy way were sick and some died. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse 17. <clears throat> but in the following instruction, I do not commend you because you come together. It is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Do you, do you understand what he's saying in that verse? Do you, you understand what Paul is saying? Paul was saying, yeah, it's, it's a bad thing. Your division and your strife and, your, and, and all of your, your junk, he said, that, I don't approve of that. I don't praise you for that, but God does do something good in that. What does he do? He reveals those who are spiritual because the spiritual don't get involved in all that garbage. They, their focus, their, their heart, and their mind is on the Lord and what the Lord wants in their personal life. They're not fruit inspectors. They don't come looking at other worshipers and criticizing how they look or how they sing or how they're dressed or what they do or how much money they have. Listen, they're, 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 not, they're not Christian investigators. They're not critical. They just come loving people in spite of people. Amen? They, they, what they, their, their life, that's God's business. Amen? That's... That's what he does. He is in the business of, of sanctifying us, of making us holy and making us righteous. That's his work. It's not, it's not our work, Matt. It's not my responsibility to straighten you out. If you come and ask, I might. <laughs> so notice what he says. He says, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Get the picture? Here you had the, the wealthy people who weren't tied to a job as a slave. They could pretty much get loose and go to wherever the meeting was whenever they wanted to. And they could just hire Johnny's Barbecue down the street and say, I want this, 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 and this, and I'll be by to pick it up at 4 o'clock this afternoon. So they just drive by Johnny's Barbecue and, and load up the car and drive to, the, to wherever they're meeting and have... Slaves or servants unload it for them. And then all the wealthy and the early, uh, the, the early groups, those that kind of uh, stuck together, and they would indulge themselves in the food and drink, and the poor ones were left out. They, they would just get in their little group because they're holier, because they are wealthier, because they're better, and their social status is much higher, and they would enjoy their meal while the other folks were left out. In fact, by the time the poor folks got off their jobs, the master let them go to the meeting, the rich and the wealthy would be drunk already. That's why he said, don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Notice what he says. He says, for I... Uh, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, 
took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after saying, The uh, cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so here's what I want to talk about this morning. We've come to the Lord's Supper, the, 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 the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And so here, here's, what I, here's what I want us to look at. Paul is saying, when we come, be ready, be prepared. Your heart better be right. 1 Corinthians 11.30, we didn't read that far, but here's the verse. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, means they have died. It's because they came and observed it in an unworthy manner. Notice what he says. In verse 27, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. So here's what he's saying. He's not saying we're worthy to partake of the Lord's Supper. That's not what he's saying. He's saying if you do it in an unworthy manner, you bring God's judgment upon you. And so what Paul says in the context is before we observe this Lord's Supper, we need to look back. What did he say? As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. We need to look back. We need to look back and remember Jesus. Now, you ever thought it's kind of strange? Who wants to remember how their loved ones die? Not many of us. That's tragic. That's sad. But Jesus said, I want you to remember me. Why? Because because the death of Jesus Christ on the cross is the very heart of what we believe, that he died for our sin, right? So he says, do this in remembrance of me. So in order to do that, we've got to look back. First of all, let's look back and remember when we were lost. How, how many of you can remember the day you got saved? I'm not talking about July 22nd, 1942. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the experience, the day you experienced being born again. Now, I don't remember what day it was when I was saved. I remember I was about 11 years old. And I don't remember, I don't remember the sermon. I, don't, I, I barely remember the name of the church, Trinity Baptist Church in Guyman, Oklahoma. That's when I got saved. Now, there came a time whenever I was very carnal and worldly. Thank God he, he saved me through all of that. I, I had to do a lot of repenting, a lot. But God saved me when I was 11 years old. I don't know the date. I know it was on a Sunday morning. I know that when I stepped out of the aisle, my mama reached for me. And she grabbed me by the shirt, and I just kind of pulled away from her. And I went down to the front, and I met the pastor, and I think his name was Brother Timothy. And I said, Brother Timothy, I want to be saved. And he prayed with me. And the next night, Monday night, he came to my house, and he explained to me what this was all about. And he explained to me baptism. It was beautiful how he, he came out to my house. He drove nine miles from Guyman, Oklahoma, to Optima, Oklahoma, and he told me what it meant to be baptized and why I needed to be baptized. And I remember that like it was yesterday. Now, I don't know about you, but you, when we look back, when we remember Jesus, when we remember him as often as we do this, we remember, we, we need to think back and think back about the day you were saved. You might not know the date, but you know the experience. We need to think about that. We need to remember what Jesus did because we were lost. One of the things he did is he came from a perfect place. He came from heaven. It was perfect. No sin. No crime. No tears. No sorrow. He left a perfect place. He, he didn't leave there because he needed something. He left there because we needed something. Because we needed what only he could give. Grace. 
salvation. But he came from a perfect place. He didn't have to, but he did. He lived a perfect life. Scripture says Jesus never committed a sin. We know that's true because he wouldn't have been a perfect sacrifice. He wouldn't have been a perfect lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He would not have been the perfect sacrifice that almighty, holy Jehovah God would have accepted for the sin of man had he not been perfect in every area of his life. See, he was perfect. We need to remember that he died willingly in our place. Scripture says, see if I put it on here, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. 1 Peter 2, verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Jesus died willingly. So we need to look back and remember that. Secondly, we need to look within. Look at verse 27 again. Verse 27 says, Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. He said, first of all, examine your heart. What's your heart like this morning? Are, are you harboring some kind of unrepentant sin in your life that you refuse to get rid of? That God has said that you don't need that in your life and you've just hung on to it? Or, or do you need to be saved, born again? God has said somewhere along in your life that you need Jesus, that you need to be saved. And, and you've said, I'll wait. Listen, if he's calling, now is the day of salvation. Today is the day. We need to look within. Paul didn't say we had to be worthy to partake, only that we do not do it in an unworthy manner. And how would we do that? To do it with unconfessed sin in our life? To do it and not be saved and to be guilty of the blood and the body of the Lord Jesus Christ? And he says we're to judge ourselves. And if we do not judge our own sins, then God will judge us and he will chasten us until we acknowledge the sin in our life and repent of that sin. The Corinthians neglected examining their own personal lives. There's strife, there's division, there's chaos. But I want to tell you what, they were experts at examining everybody else's life. Are you a Corinthian here this morning? <laughs> you know, that's one, of the, one, that's one of the nastiest names anybody could ever be called. You Corinthian. <laughs> so next time, you, next time you're tempted to cuss somebody out, just look at them and say, you're a Corinthian. <laughs> they probably won't know what that means anyway. <laughs> Do you know that chastening is, is God's way of loving his children? Hebrews 12, 6, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens every son whom he receives. Listen, this judgment here is not in judgment of some criminal. It is talking about the disciplinary love of God that he has for his own. He wants us to repent of the sin. He wants us to walk in close fellowship with him. So we need to look within ourselves. And last, we need to look ahead. Look at verse 26, the last part of verse 26. He says, you proclaim the Lord's death when, how, how, until he comes. Hallelujah. That's when all the sorrows are going to be gone. That's when all the tears are going to be wiped away. That's whenever, that's whenever I'm tempted to slap somebody across the jaw. I won't have that temptation anymore because it'll be sin that brought me there and there won't be any sin there. Amen? Listen, we, we, we are saved from the penalty of sin the day that we receive Jesus Christ. 
We are daily being saved from the power of sin as we grow in spiritual maturity and we're able to fight off the temptation to say something, do something, go somewhere that we're not supposed to do. We're growing in the strength to obey the Lord in what he says. But one of these days, we're going to be saved from the very presence of sin. I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of fighting the devil. I'm just tired. And I'm ready. Amen? And one of these days, the clouds are going to burst open, and you're going to hear the voice of the archangel and the trumpet, and Jesus is going to say, come on down, or come on up. I'm ready for it. Amen? Amen? I don't know what we're going to look like, but we're going to look good. We're going to be good. Watch this, 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. All the guesswork will be gone. We'll be seeing him face to face and eyeball to eyeball. Listen, that's not a fantasy. That's not a fairy tale. That is absolute truth. Amen? The Lord's Supper should be a time of thanksgiving and joy. Joy because I know things are bad in this country right now. But let me tell you something. When you read through the scriptures, when were the most times that God intervened in the life of a nation or a people? When they were in trouble, <laughs> right? And we're in trouble. And, and we, ought, we, we ought to be thankful this morning. We, live, we still live in the greatest nation in the world. I don't care how bad it is or how many problems we have. Am I prejudiced? No, I'm a patriot. And we live in the greatest country that history has ever known. There's, there's never been a country like the United States. Don't expect there ever will be. And I'm proud to be an American. I'm glad to be a Christian, but I am proud to be an American. And we've got a lot of problems, but listen, Christians need to, we, we need to get off to the side, and, and we need to pray, we need to lift our country up and our leaders up, and we need to, need to expect God to do, we need to stop all of our bickering and our arguing and our division about this or that, politics, uh, pandemics, uh, economy, whatever our, whatever our division, we need to lay all that aside. We need to come together and love the Lord and love one another and pray for this nation. Amen? That's what we need to do. And celebrating the Lord's Supper, that's a time of joy. That's the time when we ought to be glad as we come together and give Jesus thanks, even, even though we're remembering his death. And his burial, but even more than that is resurrection. And the fact that he was a first fruit. Amen? We're going to follow him. The deacons will come. Brother Jameson's going to come, and we're going to have just a moment of invitation.